Uh, this evening, we have a very special uh, guest here with us. Uh, he reigns from the Diocese of Kalamazoo. He's a well-educated fellow. Uh, he earned his Bachelor's of uh, Religious Studies from the University of Illinois, fellow Big Ten school. He earned his Master's in Classics from the Catholic uh, University of America and has done doctoral work in patristics. He studied at the Seminary of the Sacred Heart uh, in Detroit, and also he studied in Rome. Uh, and has, Father, do you have a licentiate, or you're working on your licentiate? I will have it this May. He will have his licentiate in sacred theology uh, from the liturgical institute, so he'll have a license to teach this stuff. He also <laughs> contributes to Crisis Magazine. He's the pastor of Sacred Heart Parish in Bangor, so it's like coming home to his home parish here. And he is the diocesan theological con consultant. His lecture tonight is titled The Redeeming Power of Beauty. And if we could please give a nice warm welcome to Father uh, Rob Gillian. Well, again, uh, I am uh, very glad to be here and uh, to speak to you about the topic of beauty and the, rede the redeeming power of beauty. We've all heard the saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, we've all uh, experienced in one way or another beauty. Um, it's a common attitude to think of beauty as something that is perceptible but not describable or not something that can be defined or analyzed, and I hope uh, tonight, among other things, to move a little closer towards being able to have something definable and understandable about beauty. For beauty to, beauty to be more than something we just sort of feel or experience to something that we can actually talk about with knowledge. Now, we've all, I, I would imagine, had the experience of being out on a clear evening and laying back on the ground or on your easy chair outside and looking up into the heavens and seeing the great array of stars in the sky. And when we see that, chances are, at least sometimes, maybe the first time, maybe many times, but we have an experience of awe. We have an experience of somehow uh, almost as though we're going out of ourselves. We have the experience of that ah moment, being overwhelmed. Being overwhelmed by something that is perceptible, but yet is somehow beyond ourselves and beyond more than in a, a mere spatial way. It's not just that we grasp that the stars are way out there, we somehow have the sense that the stars, that the heavens are um, in an existential way beyond us, that there is something about the vastness of the universe that suggests there is something beyond what we hear and what we now experience. We also can have that same kind of experience in the nature of this world. When we go to a beautiful place, something like Yosemite Valley, we go and we see a great vista before us. We see something that is the handiwork of God. And again, we are moved by it. It affects us. It does something to us. We are the better for having seen and experienced it. We can have that same kind of experience not only with things that are great and vast, but things that are nearer to us. I do not have the privilege of being a father in the natural sense, but those of you who are parents can have that experience. I can't tell you how many times 
when I've spoken to the mother or father of a newborn and they tell me about holding that baby the first time in their hands and being awed, being profoundly touched by the beauty of that little baby. So we can be touched, we can see, we can experience, we can have a sense of the transcendent even from the beauty of the human form. All of these things have an effect. All of these things influence us. All of these things touch us because in one way or another, they are a contact with the real. When we see a vista like that Yosemite Valley, we are in contact with something that is real and that is beyond us. Our senses perceive these things around us and our mind, our intellect, does something with that perception. We'll talk more about what it does in a little bit. But the point that I want to just start out with is that the experience of beauty is the experience of the real. In other words, it's not just in our heads. There is something going on out there. Something going on between us and whatever the object of our perception is. Now, beauty is, in a sense, connected to and reveals the divine. Why? Because beauty reveals the handiwork of its maker. Everything that is, is made by God. Everything that is, is something that God reveals himself to us through. So I want to talk for a couple of minutes about what beauty is and how it affects us. The 20th century Catholic philosopher Jacques Maritain, in his book, or I should say his article, Art and Beauty, talks about St. Thomas Aquinas' definition of beauty, that the beautiful is that which gives pleasure on sight. On seeing it, we are pleased. On perceiving it, we are pleased. He then explains that when we apprehend, when we perceive something beautiful, it confers a kind of intuitive knowledge on us. This is where I was getting at, what I was getting at before, with this idea that there's more than just in our heads, all right? We gain a kind of knowledge of the thing we perceive. And the effect of knowledge is a joy in knowledge. We were built to know. We were built to know that which is around us. And so there is a joy in knowing. Now, depending on the profundity of that which we know, it might be a little joy, but it might be a great, big, vast joy. Now, we perceive beauty as we perceive everything else with our senses. And so, our senses being ordered to knowledge means that when we perceive something beautiful, beauty is not the object merely of our emotions. No, beauty is the object of intelligence. This is very important because it indicates the connection between God's, between beauty and God's revelation of himself. God's revela revelation is directed to the end of knowing. Beauty also has as its end a kind of knowledge. Therefore, if we perceive God or divine things as beautiful, that reveals to us some kind of knowledge of God. Furthermore, when we perceive something that God has made, we also, in a way, 
gain knowledge of God. Because God reveals himself in everything that he has made. Again, St. Thomas Aquinas says, Beauty brings intuitive joy because it is an excellence or perfection in the proportion of things to the mind. And here we go again with this connection between the thing perceived and ourselves. In other words, when we perceive something beautiful, we perceive some kind of proportion between ourselves and the object. When we look at something like the discus thrower, a great work of art, and we perceive it as beautiful, now we may not, I'm sure most of us wish we had a physique like that. We may not have a physique like that, but nonetheless, we perceive a proportion between ourselves and the object. In other words, at some unconscious level, we know that this statue in some way represents what the ideal of myself is. Now, there's a sense then of a sort of a fittingness. There's a sense of a connection between the mind and its object. Again, St. Thomas assigned three conditions. Proportion, this fittingness or relatedness, integrity, and brightness or clarity. A beautiful thing perceive or, or, or possesses all of these things. A beautiful thing has proportion, it has clarity or brightness, and it has integrity. Integrity, that is, it is a whole. In some way or another, it makes sense to us as a whole. It has clarity. Well, I'll talk about clarity in a minute. So, the most important quality St. Thomas talks about is this brightness or clarity. He uses the phrase, the forme splendor, the brilliance of form, to talk about something that's beautiful. And when he uses that word form, he's using it in a philosophical sense, in an Aristotelian sense. The form of something as Aristotle, as Aquinas, as the scholastic philosophers hold. The form of something is that which makes it what it is. It's whatness. So we talk about the form of a human being, we're talking about that which makes a human being what it is. In the case of a human being, the spiritual soul. So St. Thomas talks about the splendor of form. The splendor of form, this claritas that reveals that element, that aspect that makes it what it is. Philosophers have sometimes referred to this as the ontological secret. The secret or the hidden thing that is the, the foundation for the being's identity. So the ontological <laughs> secret is the inmost, often hidden reality of a being. It's also known as the form or whatness. A beautiful thing reveals the truth of its being. A beautiful thing reveals the truth of its being. So when we see something like these statues, we perceive them as beautiful, and in some way, they convey to us a knowledge, and they convey to us a truth about being, about what they are or what they represent. Now, a beautiful thing is knowable for what it truly is. An ugly thing either masks or obscures that whatness, that ontological secret, or an ugly thing is something that has in some way be made to negate being. Now, when we look 
again, at something that's beautiful, it reveals truth to us. We can know what it is. It is knowable. When we see something beautiful, we don't ask, what is that? Some examples. Now here we have a photograph of a woman in an evening gown. Now, we look at the photograph and we recognize it's a woman. It's an attractive woman. She's wearing what seems to me anyway to be a nice dress, okay? We see something and we perceive beauty, we perceive the true reality of what she is. We don't ask when we see this, what is that? When we see a well done portrait, we also can perceive, okay, another beautiful woman, clearly a woman, a young woman, all right? We don't ask. What is that? We know what it is. The portrait reveals something about the person, the being that it is. This is in distinction to certain forms of modern so-called art. For example, this painting by Picasso. Here we have something that, well, it, the title of it is a woman. A part, well, portrait of a woman in green is the name of the, the uh, painting. But does this reveal the whatness, the reality of a woman, of femaleness? No, it's a distortion. Now, you may, and some philosophers, some aestheticians might argue that this is important art because in, uh, in some way it causes us to rethink our perception of what is, but nobody looking at that is going to say, that's a beautiful woman. <laughs> it may be important. It may be in some way uh, groundbreaking, but it doesn't reveal beauty. So, as I said, beauty reveals the truth of being. <clears throat> In this way, we're returning now to this connection between beauty and knowledge. Maritain wrote that while the beautiful is not a kind of truth, it nonetheless has a close dependence on what is true. Brilliance of form could also be described as truthful disclosure of being. The beautiful gives delight to the mind because the mind delights in being. This is another important thing. Our minds were made for being. Being gives us joy. The negation of being causes us distress or sorrow. The most obvious example of this is death. When we see even a flower die, there's a sense of loss, there's a sense of disappointment. And of course that sense of loss and disappointment, it becomes even height, more heightened as the importance of that being who's died uh, goes sort of up on the scale of existence. Obviously, when someone close to us dies, our sorrow is profound. Being has been negated, whereas for a normal person anyway, at the birth of a child. There is joy. When a person accomplishes some great thing, there is joy. Because in all of these things, being either is in some way made manifest, or in some way the quality of that being is increased. So the mind delights in being. Beauty is truthful disclosure of being. So this delight, this enlightenment, this um, enjoyment of the good of being is a fundamental good of existence. St. Thomas classified the beautiful as not a kind of truth, as I said, but a kind of good. The true, I'm sorry, the good and the true and the beautiful these three transcendentals are all related. 
they all are intertwined. And beings that have one quality in some way or another usually can be perceived to have the other qualities. Now, the Platonic uh, sense of these things ascribes these transcendentals to a realm of unknowability in themselves. Oh, sorry. No. Um, <clears throat> they are somehow out there. Our understanding as Catholics, as the church's philosophers have thought these things through, sees these things as a little more approachable, a little more something that we can relate to. But all of them relate to being itself. They're distinct, but they're not separable. They can be predicated on one another. So for example, if something uh, possesses the true, it will also in some way possess the good. A being that possesses the quality of the good will also in some way possess the quality of beauty. Because being is one, being is the fundamental good, and beauty discloses the reality of being. Now these transcendentals can be attributed to God in the fullest, most perfect sense. In fact, God has them all to an infinite degree. God is infinitely true, infinitely good, infinitely beautiful. And so, beauty, like the others, is a divine attribute. God is beautiful. And, therefore, God, in his beauty, is reflected in the beauty of the things that he made. God is the one who imparts beauty to everything that is. And their beauty, according to, again, Jacques Maritain, is nothing but a likeness of the divine being. Created things that possess the quality of beauty because they reflect that similarity, that likeness of divine beauty, can again be understood as revealing something of God. For this reason, Pope Benedict, in a 2009 general audience, taught that the way of beauty, the via pulchritudinis, is a privileged and fascinating way to approach the mystery of God. The way of beauty is the way of approaching God as he has revealed himself through created things that reflect his beauty. Now when we speak about this human encounter with beauty, we have to talk about how we perceive, how we apprehend beauty. We cannot experience beauty, the transcendental, in and of itself. It is a spiritual thing. And like every spiritual thing, while it has true being, it is not perceptible by us in an immediate way. No, we can only perceive beauty through beautiful things. The only means of communication that we have with any of the transcendentals is through some created being. And so it is with beauty. We perceive beauty through beautiful things. Everything that possesses beauty, therefore, is a kind of sign that points beyond itself. Indeed, one could even suggest that beautiful things themselves have a kind of sacramentality. And I'll explain what I mean by that. You see, beautiful things reveal that divine attribute of beauty. They are a sign that points 
beyond what we see and perceive here and now. They invite us to something beyond. Well, sacraments do something very similar. A sacrament, of course, is an efficacious sign. A sacrament does more than a beautiful thing, but a beautiful thing does something on a smaller scale that's similar to what a sacrament does. They point to what is beyond. The sacrament points to what is beyond and gives us what is beyond. The beautiful thing doesn't give us what is beyond, but it does point us in the direction. And this, in fact, explains the pagan impulse to worship created things, beautiful things in nature. They saw the beauty of creation. They saw the sky, the sun, the stars. They saw the beauty of the human form. They saw all these things and they inferred correctly that all of these created things had some divine referent. The mistake they made was not one of the concept, but the one of execution. They actually didn't take their insight far enough. They didn't understand that there was something being reflected in these creating thing, created things that really was beyond them. So, beauty, as I said, reveals this uh, sacramentality, this connection, this pointing to what's beyond. Now, the ultimate beauty, of course, is God and his son, our Lord Jesus. And all beautiful things one day will be recapitulated, will be fulfilled, will be summed up in Christ. Now, we, being made in the image of God, image and likeness of God, we're not only gifted or privileged with the ability to perceive the beauty in creation, no. Because you see, we're made in the image and likeness of God. It means God bestowed on us some share, some participation in God's own creativity. We cannot make things from nothing, but we can take what he has made and use them to make other things that are new and, again, in some way, reflect the divine. And here we come to the phenomenon of art. Art, which at its highest levels, it can express the most profound human perceptions and insights into the nature of creation, into the nature of man, and even the nature of God. Pope John Paul II, in his letter to artists, said that the divine artist has passed on to the human artist a spark of his own surpassing wisdom, calling him to share in his creative power. We frequently, when we talk about, or an artist will talk about one of his works, when he unveils his new sculpture, when he's working on his new painting, he'll refer to it as his creation. Come and look at my new creation. It's a sign of that human participation, that human imitation of what God does in the fullest sense. <laughs> so just as the work of the artist reflects God's creative activity, and God is beauty itself, and creation manifests as beauty, so the work of the artist, as it attains to its proper end, also manifests beauty. Or, again, as Maritain said, the end of art is beauty. To say that something is an ugly work of art is a contradiction in terms. Just as it would be a contradiction in, in terms to, to refer to a dead human being. No, it's not a dead human being, it's a corpse. 
A human being is, by definition, a being that is the union of an immortal soul and the human body. Again, in, a, in the same way, to talk about ugly and art is to kind of contradict oneself. The artist achieves or uses or, or gains his end by using his gift of insight. And that's the gift part of the artist. The artist has in some way been gifted in whatever his medium is with a kind of perception that may indeed be unique to him. There's also, of course, the, the technique, the skill that the artist must, must learn, but the artist has in some way been given a gift. And he uses this gift to do what the philosophers call abstract, something from the nature of his subject and call attention to that aspect in a way that reveals that ontological secret, that inner, deeper reality. The artist is the one who looks at or hears something, sees something, perceives something, and focuses on one or several aspects of it, bringing those things out into the foreground in order to bring to our attention something that we may not have noticed otherwise. So, for example, a good portrait of someone can be said to reveal something about the person. Pope John Paul II said, every genuine artistic intuition goes beyond what the per senses perceive and reaches beneath that reality surface, striving to interpret its hidden mystery. This reaching beneath the surface, interpreting the hidden mystery, is that process of abstraction. The ancients used the word sacramentum to describe this phenomenon. The word sacramentum is means that which makes something which makes present something which is hidden. Insofar as the art fulfills an end, it makes present the hidden reality. And the artist does this through this, prospect, pro, pro, this process of abstraction. I'll give you an example of this. I kind of said all that, so I'll skip that. Here we have a photograph of Queen Elizabeth as a young woman. She was in her early 20s when that photograph was taken. Now, the skilled photographer can in his own way, abstract and call attention to something in a way. But I don't want to focus on that. What I want to focus on is the portrait. Now we look at the portrait, and it was done at about the same time that this photograph was taken. And we can see that this portrait does more than what the photograph does, all right? The portrait calls to mind, highlights things that a mere photograph will not. For example, I have a couple of friends who are painters, and one of the things that they tell me is that the good portrait, portrait artist will spend a vast amount of time on the subject's eyes compared to other parts of the person's face or body. Why? Because the eyes reveal so much about that inner nature of ours. In this portrait, the artist has taken his perception about Elizabeth and has made it into a painting which in some way gives us more than the photograph does. The photograph captures one instant of Elizabeth. The portrait captures something of the whole person. Obviously, 
she did not hold that expression on her face for however many hours the artist took to paint the portrait. And so the artist had to use his imaginative, perceptive abstraction to try to render what is Queen Elizabeth's habit of mind? How is she in terms of relating to the world around her? Now I want to contrast that with a more recent example of a portrait. Here we have the Duchess of Cambridge, Kate Middleton, in a fairly ordinary, candid portrait. Now last year, she had her first official portrait done, and it created quite a stir in England, and actually throughout much of the art world. And when you see it, you might have an idea as to why. So, now most people, when they saw that portrait, instinctively reacted, ugh, ugh, something is wrong with that portrait. It, created, it had a lot of criticism from art critics and from just ordinary people. Now, the portrait is done in what's called the photorealistic style. But even photorealistic style doesn't account for what's going on here. Firstly, we know the portrait is just dead on, facing squarely forward. It's not very common in portraits. There's usually at least a little bit of an angle or something going on, because by viewing the subject on an angle, you naturally will perceive some things in a more, um, a more, to, a more to the foreground than others. But the real problem here is that the artist hasn't done his job. The artist hasn't really abstracted anything from Kate's face to the portrait. The portrait has all the charm of a mugshot. <laughs> the portrait would allow you to identify the Duchess of Cambridge on the street, but not much else. This portrait is not a failure of technique. If you were to look at it in a larger uh, view or see it in person, you'd see it's very technically well done. The artist knows how to paint. But if you read interviews and that by him, what you see is that he's made a deliberate decision not to abstract. The artist also can use this process of abstraction in painting or sculpting something from nature. Here we have Albert Bierstadt's, one of his famous series of paintings of Yosemite. It's a painting that is to represent mourning in Yosemite Valley. Now, obviously, if you go to Yosemite Valley, you're not going to see it looking quite like that, even on a misty morning. No, what the artist has done is, again, using this Tech, using this gift or process of abstraction, what he's done is bring some things into higher relief than others. So we get a sense not only of what Yosemite looks like, but what Yosemite is. So all true human art makes the reality of what it to portrays known. Beauty reveals truth. Beauty is truthful disclosure of being. And so, as Pope Benedict wrote, all true human art is an assimilation to the artist, to Christ, the mind of the creator, the mind of the one who made everything that is. And so, because of this quality of art, the church has made use of art throughout its history. 
made use of art to portray, to illuminate, to make present to us the divine mysteries, the mysteries of our salvation. And so, sacred art reveals beauty to us in a special way, reveals beauty to us in a way that directly, or I'm not saying directly, but does, in a way, make divine realities known to us in a way that goes beyond what nature itself can do. The church needs art. Sacred art makes perceptible heavenly realities, realities that are invisible. Art communicates a message. In sacred art, it communicates the message of God, the message of Christ. And so sacred art presents to us, illuminates those heavenly realities again in a way, as I spoke about before, that's akin to the sacraments. And so, when we look at, when we talk about sacred art, these heavenly realities are made present, made manifest to us in the sacraments. And art takes up from what the sacraments give us, sacred art does, and presents them to us in another way in a way that complements what the sacraments do in and of themselves. So again, we're talking about the revelation of divine realities. Sacred art and the sacraments come together in the highest and the most profound way in the church's liturgy. Liturgy, again, makes divine realities present to us. Sacred art makes heavenly realities present to us. And so, in the liturgy, these things come together, and they reinforce and build up on one another. The liturgy also does not make those heavenly realities present to us in a direct way. Liturgy mediates these heavenly realities. And so, the spiritual is made known to us through the material. Signs and symbols. Again, what we talk about when we talk about sacraments. In the Constitution on the Liturgy of Vatican II, we're told that the liturgy involves the presentation of man's sanctification under the guise of signs perceptible by the senses and accomplished in ways appropriate to each of those signs. Or, as I'm sure most of you will remember, the definition of a sacrament. A sacrament is a visible sign, a sign instituted by Christ. To do what? Give to give grace. grace, exactly. Now, sacred art can't give us grace, but it can point to where grace does come from, to the source of all grace. So, sacred art reveals heavenly things to us, and it does so in a mediated way. Sacred art does this also, when I talk about these things coming together, then we're talking about what I would call liturgical art. When I talk about liturgical art, or sacred art, we're talking about things like painting, things like music, things like sacred architecture. All of these ways manifesting artistic endeavor that make the church's liturgical life what it is. When, going back in history a while, when the emperor of the Russians in the 10th century, Vladimir, 
Russia was still pagan at this point. When he sent emissaries to try to find the true religion, he sent emissaries to the Muslims, he sent emissaries to the Roman Christians, and the emissaries, sorry folks, found both of these religions lacking. But his emissaries that he sent to the Orthodox in Constantinople had a different reaction. We're told they journeyed to Constantinople and here at last, as they attended the divine liturgy in the great church of holy wisdom, they discovered what they desired. And they said, we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth, for surely there is no such splendor or beauty anywhere upon <coughs> earth. We cannot describe it to you, only this we know, that God dwells there among men, and that their service surpasses the worship of all other places. For we cannot forget that beauty. That is one of those properties, one of those hallmarks of sacred beauty. Once you've experienced it, you cannot forget it. The worship of God connects us to God and in some way reveals the beauty of God. Pope Benedict XVI explained, when faith in the litur celebrated in the liturgy encounters art, a profound synchrony is created because both can and want to praise God, making the invisible visible. Making the visible invisible, that is that truthful disclosure of heavenly realities. The transcendentals being interrelated are all made manifest also in the liturgy. Because Christ is the ultimate truth who is made manifest in the liturgy. Goodness is of God, the ultimate good. And of course, beauty also is that revelation, that disclosure of God. Now, I'm going to take a couple minutes here to talk about, because I'll admit this is one of my personal hobby horses, um, to talk about beauty in sacred music. It's easy, in a sense, to see how to understand how this process of abstraction works in the visual arts. You see something, you paint it. All right? But with music, it's a little harder to figure out. At least it seems to me that way. But one of the things we have to understand is that music has a special power, a special um, capacity. Aristotle explained, and St. Thomas agreed with him, that, or that music has a capacity to directly touch the human soul. Music, as it were, reaches right in and grabs your soul. That's why church fathers like Augustine both loved it and were suspicious of it. Augustine was suspicious of music because it had such a profound effect on him. And he understood clearly the danger of something that could reach right into your soul. Something that can reach right into your soul can affect you profoundly for good or for ill. Although, however, Augustine did in the end conclude that sacred music is a good thing and we don't need to worry about that. Other music, well, have to be careful about. St. Thomas explained that the use of music in divine praise is something that lifts the hearts of the faithful to God, makes them more inclined to devotion. But he calls it something important. Salutary, that is, having a salvific significance. Music, sacred music, by reaching into the soul, 
by leading the soul to God, has a way of immediately, you know, as a way of right here and now, focusing our attention on the divine. And so I'm going to take a moment, and I want to listen, I want to have everybody just listen for a little bit to the setting of the Ave Maria by Archidelt. Yeah, go ahead and click on that there. And I might have to click it. Ah, I apologize for the sound. Yeah, I hope everybody can hear it. We had some technical difficulties. I'm going to guess that everyone here heard that and thought that's beautiful. Any uh, any dissension on that? No? Okay. What's the effect that has on us? Well, for one thing, it turned our attention to heavenly realities. Alright? And I and St. Thomas Aquinas and others would argue that in its own way, it made that heaven reality in some way present to us. When we sing, when we listen to sacred music, as St. Thomas said, we are lifted up to God. But even more so, we are brought into contact, into perception, with divine love. St. Augustine said, we're going to skip Johnny Cash. I had a point I was going to make about with Johnny Cash, but it's kind of an incidental point and we're running over as it is, so I want to move along. St. Augustine said, Cantare amantis est. To sing is a lover's thing. Love, naturally, almost unbidden, desires to sing. I mean, I don't know what the percentage is exactly, but I'm going to guess the vast majority of all the songs ever made are love songs. There is, an, there is something important in that. Every 
every song of sacred music is, in a sense, a love song. Because it is either expressing or making manifest God's love to us, or it is in some way us reflecting divine love back onto him. The love that God gives us, which we receive imperfectly and give yet back still imperfectly, but nonetheless give back in a real way. Love is ordered to praise. Love is ordered to being. Love affirms being. Love affirms the one who is created and the creator. One interesting thing, one distinctive thing, I think, about sacred music and its manifesting of heaven realities is the way that a composer or musician can build upon something that he has received, a work of his forebears, and then recreate or expand upon it with the result that what we have then is at the same time old and yet new. And the new in some way can go beyond or reveal something more deep about it that heavenly reality. And so I'll give you an example here. <clears throat> I hope you're, you're familiar with the ancient hymn, the Alma Redemptoris Mater, Tender Mother of the Redeemer. It's one of the four uh, Marian antiphons that is used at the conclusion of the divine office uh, throughout the church year. And it goes like this. <clears throat> I'm going to take a sip of water first. Alma Redemptoris Mater, Que per via celi porta manes, Et stella maris succure cadenti, Surgere qui curat populo, Tu que genuisti, natura mirante, tuum sanctum genitorem. Virgo prius ad posterius, Gabrieli sabore, subens illudave, peccatorum miserere. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Here we have that hymn of praise to our Blessed Mother in perhaps its simplest form. But another compo composer comes along a few hundred years later and does this to it. Go ahead and click the...
in that piece by Palestrina, Palestrina started with that simple chant melody and built onto and above it. In fact, if you pay, were paying attention, the chant, or I'm sorry, the motet by Palestrina begins, Ama, and then the rest of the parts come in, and one of those parts is always singing in some way the chant melody. The melody might be stretched out at points or compressed, but that chant melody is always within the music. And so Palestrina creates something there that goes beyond the chant and tells us or conveys to us, communicates to us something that goes more deeply than the chant, but yet does not toss the chant out or throw it out. That's why, among other things, that the church has always put polyphony, the music of this style, on a par almost with that of chant. So that when in the church of pronouncements, frequently uh, the popes and the Second Vatican Council, they'll talk about chant and polyphony almost in the same breath. Music as I said, is ordered to love, it's ordered to praise, and that's why the church has always taught that music is not something that's just added on to the liturgy, that it's integral to the liturgy. It's the expression of worship itself. Why? Again, because it reveals something to us of divine realities. The ontological, the connection of, at the level of being between music and liturgy lies in this revelatory character. We are made for God's glory and praise. And in liturgy, we praise and glorify God in the fullest way. In liturgy, our being, our meaning, is brought to its fullest expression in this life. And so, liturgical music and all of sacred art come together in its fullest expression, in its highest expression in the liturgy, because they all work together to reveal, reveal the heavenly realities which we must perceive in some way in a mediated fashion. Beauty is redemptive, I would say. Beauty is redemptive because it reveals to us the truth of what is, and sin and death are the negation of being. They are the negation of what truly is. To perceive beauty is in some way to perceive reality truly, and therefore is to perceive the divine. In our fullest participation in beauty, in the liturgy, we are brought into contact with the divine, and the divine is made manifest to us. Again, it makes known to us the truth of what is, and making known to us the truth of what is, it makes ultimately known to us who God is, who we are and who, are meant, who we are meant to be. Christ is the all-beautiful one. He's the all-beautiful one who, through art and liturgy, is made manifest to us. And so, in sacred art, humanity musters the fullness of its insight, the fullness of its creative power, the fullness of its, its, fullness of its participation in God's creative capacity to do something which we couldn't do by ourselves. It brings heaven and earth together, gives us a foretaste of heaven, a foretaste here and now of the beauty and the glory which will be perfected in the life of heaven. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. I've gone a bit over. Uh, I'm happy uh, if anybody has questions or comments. I'm 
happy to take those. And uh, again, thank you very much.